grateful for what God has done in my life. And I know he has so much more. I look around all the time and every time I get here, I'm just so grateful for the people that he's placed in my life. I'm grateful for my pastor Ezra, sister Ruthie. I'm grateful for all the leaders. God has surrounded us with such great leaders. People that have been standing in the gap for years and they have so much experience with this walk with God. And I'm so privileged that God brought me to the best church. I also just want to take a, a moment real quick just to thank Kenny and Sister Frankie because I thought I was just stepping into a D-home just because it was a place where I needed to live. It was a good second step for me after coming back. For those of you that don't know, I, I, I spent 15 months in the home. I, I went all the way to Amsterdam, to the UTC, and now I find myself in the discipleship home with Kenny and Sister Frankie, and it's not, it's not by mistake. It's not by coincidence. I believe that God has brought me to that house with Kenny to fight right alongside with him, to, to be leaders together, to grow together, and I'm extremely grateful for being in their house. And I have one more thank you. I just want to thank uh, the media team up there. That's, that's my team. I want to give you guys a shout out real quick. I love you guys. You guys are doing great. The media team is growing. God is doing something good in the media team right now and creatives all over. God has brought me on a journey. I'm just, I'm simply just saying yes to him. I'm just taking the steps. Every open door that he gives me, I just want to walk through it. And I believe that he's given me a word here tonight. And I just want to pray real quick that, that he would allow me to illustrate it the way that he spoke it to me. I, I pray that he would allow me to illustrate it correctly to you guys. And I hope that it would mean something to you and it would be something that equips you. Heavenly Father, Lord, this is your word, God. It's already anointed. The, the anointing is already here. It's not anything that I'm going to do, Father. It's, it's already flowing, God. I just pray that I would be able to step into it and allow you to use me as a mouthpiece right now to speak directly to your people, Father. I thank you for what you're going to do, Lord. I, I pray that you would envision your people here tonight, God. That this would be something that they carry with them, God. Allow them to walk away with something here, God, and use it as a weapon. For where you're taking us, God, you're taking us to mega, you're taking us to miracle territory, God. And I pray that I could continue, Father, the walk that you're leading us on. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we all say amen, amen and amen. Give the Lord some praise real quick. You guys may take your seats. Thank you, worship team. Our worship team is awesome. Thank you guys for having my back. <clears throat> like I said, God has brought me on a journey. And I love the journey I'm on. It's, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I'm tired. It gets difficult at times. There's those highs. There's those, those lows. And when I was preparing for this, God placed something in my heart. And I couldn't figure out exactly why at first. But I began to think of a character in the Bible, and his name is Elijah. We're going to be reading out of 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 1. And Elijah has such a special part of his journey that he's going on right now. And it reads like this. It's going to be a little bit of reading. I, I, I hope we're all hungry here tonight. I know we're on our fast. So I questioned. I was like, God, this is a lot of scripture. He said, your people are hungry. So feed them. I said, amen, Lord. So starting at verse 1, it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, 
It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. The journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this word right now, Lord. I just pray your anointing will continue through it, Lord. I love you, and I thank you in the name of Jesus. Now we can see right here that Elijah was a man called by God. Elijah had a mission. Elijah had a focus. But he was called in such a dark time. The Bible says that the king that reigned at the time, his name was Ahab, did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Somebody say it was a dark time. Not only did Ahab worship other gods and was in the middle of leading the entire nation into worshiping other gods, but he also caused the rebuilding of the city of Jericho, which was cursed by Joshua to whoever would attempt to rebuild the city ever again. In short terms, he lived in a time when people were doing everything that God told them not to do. It was a dark time. And in the midst of all this chaos... God called Elijah, much like he's called some of you here tonight. I don't know where you stand. I don't know where you're at with your walk with God. Maybe it's your first time walking through these doors, but I want to let you know you're called by God. In this dark time that we live in, God has called you. Maybe some of you feel like you're not called to ministry. Let me tell you something. You're called to love Jesus. You have a calling on your life. Now, Elijah... He's known for performing many miracles by God. He's known for things like stopping the rain just by his word. He's, he's known for being fed meat and bread by the ravens. He's, made for, he's, he's known for multiplying the last bit of flour and oil that a widow owned and multiplying it enough to feed Elijah, herself, and her entire household for days. He's also known for bringing that same widow's son back to life from the dead. And perhaps one of the most remembered miracles of calling down fire from heaven to prove to the people the great power of the almighty God that he served. And yet after all these miracles that Elijah had performed, we find him here hiding in a cave. You see, we see that Elijah had a mentality telling him. He he told himself, he told God, he said, it's enough. I'm done. I've done all that I can. There's nothing else that I can do. I'm scared. I I can't go any further. I don't know what to do. He, He says something like this. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, and they still won't listen. Now, I think Elijah's showing us a lot of things that we can relate to here. He says, the people have torn down your altar. They've killed all your prophets. And now they seek to kill me. But they still won't listen. Have you ever felt like that before? You ever felt like you've done all that you could? You've, you feel like you've been praying all that you can. You, you, you've been moving for the Lord all that you can. You, you've been trying your best. But they still won't listen. It still won't work. You ever felt like that? Have you ever told yourself, I've been trying to set an example for my family. But they still won't listen. 
I've been trying to be on fire for you at my job. They still won't listen. I've been trying to build my ministry, God. They still won't listen. I've been trying to get that job. I've been trying to fix my finances. I've been trying to find my next step, God. I've been trying to fix my marriage. I've been trying to teach the disciples, Lord. And nothing's working. And now after all that Elijah has done, the demand for his life has caused him to shrink back and say, it is enough. I'm done. I got nothing else left in me. Let me tell you something. He found himself in a place that he was not supposed to be. And God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah has allowed himself to be driven out of the fear of what he thinks he can do rather than what God can do through him. Come on, have you ever hit that point when you're at rock bottom and you say, God, I can't do anything else and God takes over? I want to I give you guys three things that caused Elijah to end up in the cave. In a place where he wasn't supposed to be. The first thing is he allowed himself to walk in a direction he was never meant to go. He allowed himself to walk in a direction he was never meant to go. If you look back a couple chapters before in chapter 17, verse 3, the first thing God tells him, he says, get away and go eastward. Hide by the brook that flows into the Jordan. You go a couple verses further. In, in verse 9, he says, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. You go a little bit further in chapter 18, God says, and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go, present yourself before Ahab. And I will send the rain on the earth. I want to tell you why he was in a place he wasn't supposed to be. This was the first time Elijah had taken a step without hearing the voice of God. This was the first time that God didn't tell him to go somewhere and he went somewhere. And he found himself in a place where he was not supposed to be. This was the first time that Elijah had taken a step without God telling him to do so. I have, I have a... A thought in my mind. When I read this, I, I could see the fear that Elijah had when he took that step and he started going in a direction that he shouldn't be going. I remember a story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit uh, uh, of history. Maybe, maybe you might be shocked. But I remember when I was on the streets of San Bernardino. Anybody know where San Bernardino is at? I was in the Dirty Dino. That's what they call it, the Dirty Dino. And I was right there. I, I, was, I, I was homeless right there. And I remember I had this kind of, he was kind of like a friend. He was a, he was a gang member. And uh, we, we would hang out sometimes. But I didn't really like hanging out with him. I, you want to know why I didn't like hanging out with him? Ask me why. Because every time I was with him, we'd get into something I didn't want to be involved in. It never failed. Never failed. Not once. He would pull up in stolen cars and... And I'd be like, no, nah, I'm not going to go hang out with you tonight, bro. And then he'd end up in jail the next day and out a couple days later. We'd go somewhere, get into a fight. We'd go somewhere, we'd end up in somebody's house we're not even supposed to be in. I thought you knew these people. You didn't, didn't even know them. Like, it, was, it, was, it was a bando. Something, I don't know. But I remember one night, and this was after we, uh, a week of maybe not getting along. He comes up to, to the, the truck that I was living in and he says, hey, let's just go, let's just go to the store real quick. I'm like, I'm, in my mind, I'm, I'm already thinking, I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. No, I don't want to go with you. He's like, let's just go to the store real quick. It's right here at the corner. It's, not, it's probably as far, not even as far as 7-Eleven is from here. It's really not. I'm like, you know what, I'll go to the store with you real quick. We'll go get something. I'll come back, and that's it. That's it. So I go with him, and I'm walking to the store. And we're passing by a familiar house that we know, not too far. And there's a car out there in the front. I didn't think much of it, but I knew, I was like, I never see that car out right there. It was a weird, it was like, it was a white minivan. And I seen it, didn't think much of it, and I passed by it. And sure enough, as soon as we're passing by, the door pops open. And I'm like, dang, what is this? And two guys pop out, and they come up to him, and they start talking to him, kind of like they're his homies at first. But then the next thing you know, one of them pulls a gun out on him to his head. And he's like, hey, hey, hey. And I'm like, oh, dang, what do I do? I knew I shouldn't have left. No, I shouldn't have left with you. 
dang it. And I'm like, hey, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm kind of almost about to be like, hey, what are you doing, man? Get up off him. You know, I, I wish I could say that I was, like, really tough on the streets. And I was like, you know, like, like and, I, and I had his back and everything. But the next thing you know, he had, he had a friend with him. And all I hear is, pew! I don't know if that sounded like, I don't know if you know what that sound was. But that was a beam on, a, on another gun pointing right at me. That's all I heard. It was, Pointing right at me. And now I wish I could say, I wish I could say that I stood up and I said, and I put my chin up to it and said, you ain't even going to do nothing. <laughs> I wish I could say that. I wish I could say that I did a jujitsu move and I grabbed the gun and I reversed it on him. I wish I could say that, but you want to know what I did? I ran. I, as soon as I heard it and I seen the light pointing right at me, I said, oh. And I did. And to add to it, I don't know why, but in my mind, I thought if I ran in a zigzag. I thought if I ran in a zigzag, just in case if he took, if he took a shot, I would already be going the other way. Like, and I'm like, so I was like. I thought it sounded, it, it, it seemed like a good idea. I tell you that because I understand the fear that Elijah had at that moment when Jezebel said, if I don't have your life by tomorrow, let, God, let the gods do to me what you've done to them. I understand the fear. Now, you would think that with all that God had done for Elijah, he would trust him enough to ask him to help in his situation instead of running from it. You would think. You would think he said, God, you... You've allowed me to bring people back from the dead. You've allowed me to, to, to stop the rain. You've allowed me to call the fire from heaven. You would think you would ask God, but instead he ran from me. Have you ever found yourself in a situation? Something like what Elijah is going through right here. Elijah allowed himself to walk in a direction he was never meant to go. Number two, he allowed himself to walk alone. It says that when he ran, he went to Beersheba and left his servant there. He left him there. He said, you know what? You, you know what? I'm just going to leave you here. I'm going to do this alone. I'm going to do this on my own. I know what I'm doing. You ever felt like that before? He, he, said, he said, I got this. I don't want you to be involved in this. I don't want you to have my back. Let me tell you something. If we're going to make it to miracle territory, if we're going to make it to a mega building, if we're going to make it to where God wants to take us, it's going to take us working together and not being alone. We're going to have to work together more than ever. We're going to have to work as a team. We're going to have to start mixing each other's ministries. Creative is going to have to work with the hosting ministry. Worship's gonna have to work with this ministry. We're gonna have to start working together as a team and not be alone. Our ministries have to be unified. Our families have to be unified. We can't stay separate. We have to work together. Somebody say, I can't do this alone. I need you. Look to your neighbor and say, I need you. Look to your other neighbor, tell him I need you. Some of you guys had trouble saying that to one of your neighbors. I heard it. That, hey, that second one, you guys hesitated to say it. You looked at him, you're like, uh, I need you. I need you, yeah. <laughs> Number three. Number three. He allowed himself to walk unaware. These are all the things that got Elijah into the cave in a place where he wasn't meant to be. He allowed himself to walk unaware. Let me tell you something about being unaware. I can catch myself a lot of times being unaware. As a matter of fact, on the way over here, I work at a school, and I got out of work. I had to catch the bus. And I was, I was thinking about my, the message that I was trying to stay locked in and focused. How, God, how do you want me to speak, speak to them? I had my headphones in. I think I was playing either worship music or some type of soft music. And a bus pulled up, and I got in it. I guess I didn't look at what number it was. 
because the bus kept going past the street that we were supposed to turn on. And I was like, whoa, where are we going, dude? What's going on here? And I had to go ask the bus driver. I was like, um, what bus number is this? He said, he said, 190. I was like, hmm. I was like, this isn't the 282? You sure? He said, nah. I was like, ah. Oh. I was unaware. I caught myself unaware. It's so easy for us as a people to be unaware. I hope you're not as unaware as I was. Anyway, I had to get off and call a lift to get over here tonight. So, Elijah was unaware. It says that after Elijah prayed that he might die, an angel touched him. Isn't that a beautiful thing? When we're at our worst and lowest points, God will send angels and say, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Here, I got something for you. I know you feel like you want to give up. I know you feel like you got nothing else in you, but I have something for you. The angel gave him cake and water. Sounds good right now. And then, stay with me, guys. Stay with me, please. We're going somewhere right now. I hope, I, I hope you guys can feel. We're, you guys feel like we're going somewhere right now? We're going somewhere. The angel gave him cake and water. And then he laid down and rested. Then the angel came and touched him a second time. And said, eat and drink for the journey is too great for you. That's the title of the message tonight. The journey is too great for you. You alone. It's too great for you, but it's not too great for him. You see, God knows that you're not able to do what he's asked you to do. He knows it's too big of a task. He knows seeing your brother, seeing your sister, Seeing your auntie, seeing your uncle, your mom, your dad being saved seems impossible sometimes. He knows it seems too great. He knows that the trials in your life are too big for you. He knows that the bigger building might seem impossible to you sometimes. He knows that three services might sound difficult. But when God gives you the food to strengthen you in his word, when you're in prayer... When you're in his presence, when you're fasting, what seems impossible to man is possible with God. But Elijah allowed himself to walk unaware. You see, the fact that Elijah could try to run away off a sudden moment of fear showed that Elijah had a weakness. It showed that Elijah was unaware of the weaknesses that kept him from doing what God asked him to do. It showed that he suffered from complexities. You see, fear will always try to oppose what God has already granted. Doubt will always be an obstacle and a hindrance to the direction that God gives you. Pride will always be the giant that you have to kill before it kills you. And if we're not careful, if we're not aware of ourselves, we could end up in a place that we're not meant to be. I love these books that Pastor Ezra has recommended to us. I I love the fact that he even took the time to make the list of books that, that, that he's gathered to be able to equip his church, to be able to equip the people. And I've been reading this book. And it talks about so, so much good stuff in it. And there's, there's a couple of things that it talks about. It talks about one thing. It talks about your shadow. It talks about facing your shadow. And what your shadow is, is it's the untamed emotions inside of you that every once in a while, they, they tend to rise to the surface and present themselves. And you tend to present something that doesn't seem like you all the time. It can sometimes be a little ugly. It can sometimes, sometimes be a little aggressive because they're untamed emotions that we don't learn to deal with inside of us that rise to the surface. There's another thing that it talks about. It talks about making this thing called a genogram. And what it is, is it's your family tree. 
and you begin to map out the characteristics of, of, of the people that are in your family, and, and you map out, hey, this, this family member had aggression, this family member was abusive, this family member was addictive, and you begin to trace it down to you, and you begin to zero in and understand why you are the way that you are. You look at that, and you're like, okay, now I understand. I understand that something was passed down to me. I understand that this may not be all, all my fault. It's not just who I am. This is something that I'm going to have to face. This is something that has been plaguing my family for a long time. I might need to face this. I might need to break some chains on this. There's another thing that it talks about. It, it, it talks about this thing called the negative script. And, and I was trying to understand exactly the way that it explained it. I was trying to understand what, what it was. And, and it's basically something that happened in your past that made you feel a certain type of way. Maybe it made you feel anxious. It made you feel fearful. It, made, it traumatized you. That when something happens in your life nowadays and, and it reminds you of that, you begin to go into shock with those same emotions that you felt when you were younger. And these are things that we're going to need to face in ourselves for us to, for us to be taken to where God needs, wants to take us. When you become aware of yourself, you're able to face yourself and say, this is who I am. This is what I deal with. I'm going to make sure that where God is taking me, I'm going to be able to operate through it. I'm going to be able to break it. I'm not going to hide it no more because you're aware. But Elijah caught himself in a place where he was unaware. He allowed himself to become unaware, but God allowed him to be in the cave. It, it's, a, it's such, a, it, it's such a, a, a complicated thing to think about, God, that God allowed him to be in the cave. Because in the next verses, God says, what are you doing, Elijah? What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. This isn't where you were meant to be. But God doesn't make mistakes. God does not make mistakes. Everything that you, happens in your life is for a reason. In verse 11 it says, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. You see, God doesn't desire to hide himself. God wants to speak to us, and I believe he wants to speak to some of you here tonight. You ever felt the sensitivity when you're fasting? You, you feel like you hear God's voice more. You, you feel like you're, when you read his word, it just, it just touches your heart in a way that, that's not normal. Because it's not because God hides himself sometimes. But it's because there's so many things covering his voice that you can't hear it all the time. There's so many things in your life, in, in, in our day-to-day -day life that just covers it. Sometimes he has to separate us. Sometimes he has to take us to a place where we can reflect and say, the way that I dealt with things before is not going to work with where God is taking me. I might have to face myself. I might have to make some adjustments. I might have to fix my attention to God and let him do what he wants to do. Stand with me here tonight. The worship team can make their way. The next couple verses say, after Elijah heard the still small voice, it says, So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he responded, he said, and he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars and, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. You see, Elijah had his mind on what he had done and what he was facing. 
He didn't have his attention on the right thing. He didn't have, he had his attention on his situation. But God had to take him to a place where he could hear his voice again. Where God could speak to him. Where all the noise was drowned out, where he wasn't busy. He wasn't over, overcrowded with busyness all the time. He, he didn't have all these worries. He separated him to a place where he could hear his voice again. And as he heard his voice, then the Lord said, go. The Lord said, go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Of Abel and Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You see, God has taken us to greater things. God is taking us to miracle territory. I'd be lying if I said that I wouldn't think it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. There's, there's going to be moments when we're afraid. There's going to be moments when we want to run away. There's going to be moments when you have to face yourself. But we're going to have to seek the voice of God and let him speak into our lives. You see, he has an anointing for you. He has an anointing for us, an anointing that's going to anoint others. There's people waiting for us. There's a building waiting for us. But it's going to take seeking his voice time and time again. 2024 is going to be a year of seeking the voice of God like never before. And if you want to hear the voice of God, he's right here at these altars. He's right here waiting for you. Don't hesitate. I know you've been waiting. You've been hesitating at moments. But he's right here waiting for you, ready to speak. Well, thanks for joining us here at Victory Outreach West Covina. We hope you enjoyed your time. Also, I want to encourage you to subscribe and click the notification bell. That way you get notified every time we go live. You won't miss a service. Stay connected with us. And you can also partner with us in your giving if you want to bless the ministry financially so we can continue the work that God is doing here. You can do that at any time. I hope you share it, and I hope you come visit us live real soon. God bless you.